Welcome to our Christmas celebration of the birth of our Savior. Our ushers are standing by to greet guests in our service today, and we see guests in the balcony. Welcome to you as well. Uh, guests, if you're a first-time visitor or you haven't filled out a card for us, uh, raise your hand and get a visitor card and fill it out and put it in the offering plate. And uh, they have bulletins as well if you need one. Um, anyone, any first-timers in our services, welcome. I see Robert made it back from China. Welcome back from China, Robert. Did you bring us some toys for Christmas? All right. I have several announcements to make. Uh, let me mention, first of all, there will be a funeral this afternoon. Uh, the visitation and then the funeral is at 3 o'clock at Forest Hills uh, Cemetery. Uh, this is for Frank Mink. And be in prayer for Joyce and, and her children and family uh, during this time. And, and, uh, and pray for the service this afternoon. I went by the angel tree earlier. And there were still two angels left on the tree. And I encourage you to go by if you haven't gotten an angel uh, yet to uh, provide for uh, gifts for uh, the children of incarcerated parents, uh, children who live here in Washington County. Um, the next two Wednesday nights in uh, uh, our Bible study here in the auditorium, uh, we are studying about man and sin in our doctrinal Bible study. We'll meet on the 11th and the 18th is then the last uh, Wednesday night for Awana and Bible study uh, before our Christmas break. Christmas Eve service is announced in the bulletin. Uh, it's on, uh, um, what, what day would it be on? December the what? Christmas Eve service on December 24 at 5 o'clock. And we're soliciting some participants to help us with that service. So if you're willing to do that, uh, provide something for that service. We'd like to hear from you. We're decorating the auditorium for Christmas on Thursday, so we can use your help. Um, on the last Sunday, the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's, the last Sunday of the month, there'll be no, no Sunday school on December 29. So we have a special program coming up next Sunday. And uh, Kevin, tell us about next Sunday. Yes, next Sunday we'll have our Christmas concert, the church Christmas concert in the morning service starting at 1040. It's invitations in your bulletin, so I encourage you to hand those out to coworkers, uh, friends and family who don't have uh, a church home that they're already attending on Sunday mornings. Um, the gospel will be presented clearly, so we hope that you'll bring those folks. Um, we've got a, a team that's been practicing on Sunday nights, so thank you team for the extra time you've been putting in for that. Um, a lot of new songs. A couple of original songs written in-house, and then a couple of our favorite carols, so a good mix. Um, uh, interspersed with some dramatic readings from different characters from the Old Testament and the New Testament, giving their sort of imagined thoughts on some of the events that went on uh, from their perspective. So. All right, let's stand. I'm forgetting one announcement. Uh, what was it? Youth... Uh, our next event is the Christmas Eve lock-in, or not Christmas, <laughs> no, not Christmas Eve lock-in, New Year's Eve lock-in. We don't want to have a lock-in on Christmas Eve, but New Year's Eve, we'll, we'll have a lock-in event. There's details that have gone out, so be aware of that. Isaiah chapter 7, we're looking at some prophecies concerning Jesus' birth throughout this month. Isaiah 7, 10 through 14 says, again, the Lord spoke to King Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which we know means God with us. What child is this who laid to rest? 
on Mary's lap is sleeping. The angels greet with anthem sweet, while shepherds watch our keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Such mean estate where ox and ass are beating. Good Christian fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. This, this is Christ the King, who shepherds God and angels. Son of Mary. So bring Since gold and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The king of kings salvation brings, let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the king, whom shepherds God and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him God, the baby. The Son of Mary, the babe, the Son of Mary, the babe, the Son of Mary. We'll play that again. Take some time and greet the folks around you this morning. Encourage them. Let's pray. Father, we don't have to look around very far to see that um, things in this world are spinning out of control. It seems like anyways, it's dark at times and we're just thankful that we can 
count on you um, that came in the form of this child we just sang about, Emmanuel, God with us. We're thankful, Lord, that we can count on you to be with us still. I just ask that we would be um, light to other people uh, during a, a season each year that um, you are sung about on the radio. Um, we can't get away from the message of the truth of your son, Jesus Christ. I just pray that we will look for opportunities, that you would provide those opportunities for us to be salt and light to the world we're in and to be living examples of the hope that is found in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I just ask with the help of your spirit, you will clear our minds and help us to be attentive to your word today. And then we might be able to leave here with something that would help us moving forward. And Lord, again, we're grateful to be here in this place, to have the freedom to be here in this place, to worship together. We thank you again, Lord, for your son. In Jesus' name, amen.
joking around with the worship team a little bit this morning in practice about the idea of it being bleak midwinter, the world frozen like a stone, snow on snow on snow, when you're talking about Israel, who gets how much snow a year? <laughs> Up north, yes, but <laughs> Bethlehem, though, Bethlehem. Talk about Bethlehem here. <laughs> I stand corrected, I guess. Um, Bethlehem, though, yeah. I think sometimes we take Christmas out of where it happened and we sort of put it where we are. You know what I mean? Have you ever seen any um, nativity paintings where they're all dressed in French style from whatever century, uh, centuries later after the events actually happened? So we have a tendency to do that. Strip some of that away and, and picture Middle East, picture desert, picture uh, Middle Eastern culture, picture people that don't have white skin, uh, picture... Picture what it would have really looked like as we sing. Let's, um, hmm, yeah, stay seated for this one, and we'll stand for the next two. In the bleak midwinter, all creation grows. For a world in darkness, frozen like a stone, light is breaking in a stable for a throne. And he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. And he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Unto us a child. Is born the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and He shall reign forevermore, forevermore. If I were a wise man, I would travel far, and if I were a shepherd. But poor as I am, I will give to him my heart, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Unto us a child is born, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Here within a manger lies the one who made the starry skies, this baby born for sacrifice, Christ the Messiah. Into our hopes, into our fears, the Savior of the world appears, the promise of eternal years. Christ the Messiah, and He shall reign forevermore, forevermore, and He shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Unto us a child is born, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and He shall child is born, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and He shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Let's stand together. Join me standing for our last two songs. <clears throat> While you're standing, Isaiah 9, 4 through 7, a well-known passage. For the yoke of His burden and the staff of His shoulder... The rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Why? Why do we have such a guarantee of victory? Verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, 
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Who's going to accomplish that? Does the church have to accomplish that? No. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. All praise to you, eternal Lord, clothed in a God of flesh and blood. You chose a manger for your throne, while worlds on worlds are yours alone. Once did the skies before you bow. A virgin's arms cradle you now And angels who in you rejoice Now listen for your inner voice They sing glory in the highest There is no other name by which you can be saved Oh, little child, you are our guest That weary ones in you may rest Forlorn and lowly is your birth that we may rise to heaven from earth Singing glory in the highest There is no other name by which you can be saved Glory in the highest Heaven and earth forever will proclaim God has come to earth
Children, you can be dismissed at this time. There are Bibles in the pew in front of you if you didn't bring one, or perhaps you have one in your hand already or uh, on your electronic device, I invite you to turn with me this morning to the book of Daniel is where we will begin this morning, the book of Daniel. As you're turning there, uh, may I encourage you, please bring food. A week from today, we're going to have dinner after church, after the musical program, so please Food to share for our program next Sunday. Who do you trust if you have a really important message? And you want to be sure the message gets delivered accurately, on time, the born loser. Y'all remember that cartoon? The born loser cartoon? Yeah. It's one of my favorites. 
A few years ago, the born loser's son is watching television. And dad goes to him and says, son, you want to go to the mall and see Santa Claus? Nah. Don't you want to tell him what's on your wish list? What you want for Christmas? I'm going to email it to him. Who do you trust with an important message? In some ways, this morning, what we are going to do in the sermon today is we are going to have four more announcements. Now, that's not what I've entitled the message. I've entitled the message this morning, The Messenger Angel Gabriel because he is the angel that God entrusts with four important announcements. So when you leave this morning, I hope you get these announcements. They're more important than the ones we started the worship service with because God sent Gabriel from heaven to earth, to make these announcements. The name Gabriel means man of God. There are two other angels. We know their names. Besides Gabriel, what other angel names do you know? Anybody? Michael. Yeah, Michael. Michael is called an archangel. In fact, in Jude 9, it says that when Michael, the archangel, contending with the devil, disputing with the body of Jesus, of the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. In Daniel chapter 10, we read about, about Michael coming to help another angel. And in chapter 12, Michael, the great prince, will arise who is in charge of your people. So we've got Gabriel and Michael. There is one other named angel. His name is, oh yeah, Lucifer. Lucifer, we don't call him Lucifer anymore because that was his name uh, before he fell. The ESV translation of that passage in Isaiah that describes his fall doesn't even use the name Lucifer. Instead, it translates it this way. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn? We know about, about Michael. We know about Lucifer. Lucifer became Satan. He became the leader of of the fallen angels. This morning, we want to look at the messenger angel. We want to learn a little bit more about Gabriel because Gabriel plays such a, an important place in the Christmas story. Remember Gabriel in the Christmas? Well, let's first look at Gabriel in the book of Daniel because before the New Testament, Gabriel appears twice in the Old Testament. And there in the Old Testament, he has two very important messages. And he is described in the Bible making these round trips from heaven to earth and back again because God has sent him on a very important errand to deliver the message of God. God. First, to Daniel. Now, you remember that Daniel was the one who interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But then Daniel had a problem. Daniel had a dream of his own. And Daniel couldn't interpret his own dream. We read about that in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King 
Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, and he describes the vision. And then in verse 15, after the the vision itself, verse 15 said, When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. Here is Daniel puzzled over the vision that he has seen. And then he gets an explanation. It says, and behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So, wouldn't it be great Gabriel could come today and help you understand? You're stuck with me today. But Gabriel came to explain Daniel's vision to him. Now, in this vision, and we just go through it very quickly. In this vision, Daniel saw a ram, and he saw a male goat. Now, sometimes, if you read a little further, the Bible explains things for us. So, look down at chapter 8 and verse 20. I'm going to pick it up at verse 19. Gabriel's explaining to Daniel. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be in the latter end of the indignation. So, Gabriel says, "Uh, Daniel, I'm giving you some information about what's going to come in this terrible time he calls the indignation verse 20 he says as for the ram that you saw with two horns these are the kings of Media and Persia so sometimes when you trouble over something and you can't figure it out just keep reading and the Bible will interpret it for you and here what Daniel saw is being interpreted by Gabriel the ram With two horns are the kings of Media and Persia, verse 21. And the goat, those are the two things that that Daniel saw in his vision. The goat is the king of Greece. The great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms to arise from his. And then verse 23, at the latter end of their kingdom, a king of bold face. This is the little horn of Daniel chapter 8 a king of bold face one who understands riddles shall arise so Daniel is being explained about this this male goat that had uh, uh, first a horn and then four horns and then a little horn that becomes great and Daniel can't interpret it so God sends Gabriel to interpret this I want to slip back and notice that when, when Daniel saw Gabriel, how would you, what if an angel appeared to you all of a sudden? What do you think you would do? Well, verse 17, he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. Pretty good response, right? So here's the, the angel Gabriel explaining something very important Uh, to Daniel this angel appears in human form Daniel is terrified and and falls down on his face and then Gabriel strengthens Daniel and interprets the vision Uh, Daniel still doesn't understand it all but we get out of this um, that angels can appear in human form now I want to step away for just a minute from uh, Daniel chapter 8 and I want to give you just a a tidbit from uh, David Jeremiah's book, The Handwriting on the Wall, in which he talks about this text in Daniel chapter 8, because it's important for you to understand that there is a, there is a celebration this month that precedes Christmas. The Jews have a celebration in the month of December. Uh, by the way, just uh, tease you with this for a minute. Can you tell me 
what day on the calendar Hanukkah appears. Uh, someone asked a Jewish man one time, what, what day is Hanukkah this what, what day is Hanukkah this year? And the answer, this is, you'll take a little while to figure this one out. The answer he gave was the same day every year. Hanukkah is always on the 25th of Kislev. It's always on the 25th of Kislev that, that the Jews celebrate the fact that this, this little horn who did some vicious things in the temple in Jerusalem back in the, in the second century B.C. was defeated by Judas Maccabus and, and they were able to cleanse the temple and to relight the candles in the temple and when they did so God tradition says God performed a miracle and provided enough oil to sustain that uh, the, the candles in the uh, in the temple until they could uh, could prepare more oil uh, that's what Hanukkah celebrates Hanukkah celebrates the fact that Daniel brought this message and uh, ultimately uh, uh, Israel went through a very, very difficult time. Uh, just a note about that difficult time. Um, the king that did this was a king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. He called himself uh, Antiochus God Manifest. That's what Epiphanes. God appears in me. Well, Antiochus decided he wanted to turn the temple uh, for the worship of God into the worship of uh, uh, Bacchus, the god of pleasure and wine. And he forced the Jews and the Greeks who were, who were uh, in, engaged in games in the temple area to strip themselves naked. In doing so, he defiled the temple. And uh, he did a, a lot of other things. In fact, one of the things he did was he walked into the sacred place of the Jews with a pig. Now that would have immediately defiled the temple area. But he did more than that. He sliced the throat of the pig and he took the blood of the pig and strewed it across the temple area, defiling the temple. It was the cleansing of the temple that we celebrate in Hanukkah after Antiochus is defeated. But the message that God sent Gabriel to deliver was a message that after Babylon would come Medo-Persia. And after Medo-Persia would come Greece. And one of the wicked Greek kings named Antiochus Epiphanes would defile the temple. That's the message of God, a message of judgment upon uh, the, the, the Jewish people and the Jewish temple that comes through this, uh, this angel messenger by the name of Gabriel. Now, a couple things we learn about angels from this. Angels appear in human form, and they deliver messages such as the two angels that appeared to Lot in Sodom and said, Lot, get out of Sodom. Now we turn to Daniel chapter 9, and Gabriel shows up again. In Daniel chapter 9, uh, Daniel is praying. Uh, he reads Jeremiah in verses 1 through th th and 2, and then in verse 3, he says, I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now, Daniel is praying, and praying, this is serious, devout praying. This is the kind of praying that we need today. Daniel had read in the book of Jeremiah that God had declared 70 years of captivity for the nation of Israel. And he got out his calculator and he said, it's 70 years. 
this is the 70th year. And he said, hey God, how are you up there? You said 70 years. This is number 70. What are you going to do? And Gabe, God said, hey Gabe, come here. Could you go down to that man named Daniel and tell him my plan? And so Daniel says, Right away, sir. How long do you think it took? I don't know. We're not told he had wings, but we do, are told that he flew. Verse 20, Daniel 8, or 9, verse 20. While I was praying and speaking, confessing my sin, you should do that. But notice, and the sin of my people Israel. How long has it been since you confessed the sin of America? in prayer that's what Daniel's doing he's confessing his own sin the sin of his nation he's presenting his plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God in essence I would say that if you put it in today's language Daniel is praying for what Daniel is praying for revival And in response to Daniel's prayer, this urgent petition before God. You know, I wonder if we prayed the way Daniel prayed. If God would send Gabriel again. Gabriel comes. And and verse 21, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision at first, that's chapter 8, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. Now, we're going to Israel again next year, and they're working on the flights. And uh, the plan is to fly out of Tri-Cities this time in October of 2020, uh, to fly out of Tri-Cities to Atlanta, to New York, to, uh, uh, to Tel Aviv. That's going to take way too long. I want, I'd like to go Gabriel's route. He says, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. He's come with another announcement, a very important announcement. If you're filling in your outline this morning, uh, letter A is the interpretation of the vision, the vision of Daniel. That's in Daniel chapter 8. Letter B, this is the second trip. Letter B is the prophecy of 70 weeks. If you're a student of Bible prophecy at all, you would recognize that phrase, 70 weeks. It is Gabriel that brings to Daniel the prophecy that's recorded here in the end of Daniel chapter 9, beginning of verse 24. 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. So this 70-week prophecy came by way of the angel Gabriel who makes a second journey. Now notice angels are not omnipresent. He wouldn't have to make a journey if he was, right? But instead he received a message from God and he came swiftly and explains his purpose and he tells Daniel, essentially, that there's coming a seven-week period of tribulation to the nation of Israel. That's my summary of the 70-week prophecy. There's coming a time of great trouble to the nation. Do you know there was an announcement made? It was made uh, 78 years ago today. Anybody remember who made that announcement? Larry, you remember? Now, 78 years ago yesterday, yesterday, does anybody know what happened 78 years ago yesterday? Ah, so that'll help you with 78 years ago today. 
Japan announced a declaration of war on the United States. Um, the Japanese sank or damaged three cruisers, three destroyers, an anti-aircraft training ship, one mine layer, 188 U.S. aircraft, 2,403 Americans were killed, 1,178 were wounded. So the next day, the president of these United States declared war on Japan, December 8, 1941. It was the same day that Japan finally, belatedly, declared war on the U.S. But Congress declared war, and the president... Franklin Delano Roosevelt proclaimed that the day before, December 7, 1941, would be a date which will live in infamy because the attack happened without the declaration of war, without explicit warning. The attack on Pearl Harbor was later judged by the Tokyo trials to be a war crime. The announcement, the United States has gone to war. That's similar to the announcement here. The nation of Israel is going to experience seven years of tribulation. That's the 70th, the 70th of the 70 weeks of Daniel. This is a message of, of Gabriel sent from God, comes to the earth, he meets with Daniel, and Daniel records his message. Now let's pause before we go on. So in the Old Testament, in these two appearances of Gabriel, we learn some important things about angels and about Gabriel. Gabriel is one, remember we learned, of three angels whose names we know. Are there any other angels with names? Are there any other angels? I don't know. I don't know. There's lots of other angels. Do they have I don't know. I know about three, Gabriel, the messenger angel we're studying this morning. Now, when angels appear, do you, do you have an angel on your Christmas tree? What does the angel look like? Did Gabriel look like that? Do your heads this way. <laughs> no, he did not look like that. He looked like, look around. See a guy around you? He looked like that. That's what Gabriel looked like. Well, not quite, but closer, but closer. So, Trudy's been working hard decorating for Christmas, and she's got a beautiful tree. You know, we picked it out on, uh, up going toward White Top, but there's, something, there's nothing on the top. Because it almost touches, us. I mean, there's that much room, and that's in the tray part. And I'd like to say, couldn't we get an angel? What would the angel look like if you put one? Let's put Gabriel up there. What would he look like? When angels appear, they often do in human form, but still their appearance is marvelous enough. It made Daniel afraid. And as we shall see, it makes others afraid. They, swipe, they fly swiftly. They are not omnipresent. Now, by the way, they do fly swiftly, our text says. So my Bible teacher was wrong. Talking about angels in Bible class, Professor Babb, B-A-B-B, when he introduced himself at the beginning of school, he would say, my name is Bab, B-A-B-B, -B, all A's and B's, and I hope you do as well. And when he got to angels, he said this. He said, uh, uh, so if you have a guardian angel, then when you're driving, the guardian angel is sitting out there on the hood. 55, sitting on the hood. 65, sitting on the hood. 75, sitting on the hood. After that, you're on your own. He was wrong. Angels fly, fly swiftly. He can keep up. 
Aren't you glad? I don't recommend you go faster than that, though. Sometimes their mission, this mission in Daniel 9, was an answer to prayer. Gabriel's message to Daniel included the good news and the bad news. The good news, they're coming back from captivity. The 70 years are over, but 70 weeks are going to begin. And the 70th week will be a time of of great tribulation. Have you ever been entrusted with a really important message? Can you think about the most important announcement you ever had to make? I sat and I thought, what? was the most important announcement and then I remembered three days after Christmas December the 28th 2006 my father was ill I asked my sister what day would you like for me to come and check on dad she said come on Wednesday Wednesday December 28 2006 Vitaly was our intern He helped me drive down to Hendersonville, North Carolina. We got there to the home where my father was staying in a secure Alzheimer's facility. We went in to check on him, and I discovered very quickly my father was dying. The nurse said, what can we do? Do you want us to call an ambulance? I said, well, let's check his chart. We opened the front cover of the chart, and there was the DNR. It was clear my dad had made his decision, and we followed his orders. I said, I want to sit by my dad. And 30 minutes later, my father was dead. But now I have a job. My mother lived in Greenville, South Carolina. Is that a phone call you make? Italy, let's go. We got to drive to Greenville. I got to tell mom, dad is dead. That's the biggest assignment I ever had that I can come up with. A message that God had given me to deliver to my mother. God's given us some good news too. We'll talk about that in a moment. But there is some bad news. And we better be faithful in telling the bad news to a world that does not know Jesus. As we tell them the good news that Jesus has come to be their Savior. Let's be faithful like Gabriel was in declaring the message that God's entrusted to us. Well, We'll have to close the book of Daniel for the moment and turn now to the book of Luke because that's when Gabriel comes again. Now, Luke chapter 1, Gabriel makes two more announcements, two in the Old Testament, two in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he interpreted the vision of Daniel and he gave the prophecy of 70 weeks. In the New Testament, he announces. Well, he announces the coming birth of John the Baptist. I looked around this morning to see if we had any Zachs in the service. Zach went out to children's church, I guess. Restroom, you'll be right. Zach, raise your hand back there, Zach. Yeah, there's Zach's with us. So I told Zach we're going to talk about him this morning. Zach, it was Zach's turn to offer incense in the temple in Jerusalem. He's an old man, and the time the lot fell upon him to enter through the veil in front of the holy place into that holy place now, in the temple. The people are outside praying. And and, and your Bible has either Zechariah or Zacharias. Uh, Zach was married, by the way. His wife's name was Liz. They were pretty old. They were older than you. But they had a great burden 
a great sadness, a great sorrow, Zach and Liz had no kids. Now, it wasn't because they were ungodly. Notice we read about them. I'm going to pick up in verse 5. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. Why are we hearing all this stuff? We're hearing all this stuff because Luke is an, is an historian. And he wants you to understand this is true history. It really happened in this time and at this place. He says he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth, Liz. They were both righteous before God, walking blameless in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child. Do you know any godly people that have burdens? Okay, this time, you're, maybe you're not asleep, but do, nod your head anyway. Do you know any godly people with burdens? Yes. We need to be reminded of that. God knows those burdens, though. And in this case, Zach and Liz have the burden of no child. And it's a great burden on their hearts. They prayed often about this. Verse 8, while he was serving as priest before the God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord. Now, now not, not into the Holy of Holies, just into the holy place, <coughs> and burn incense. That's where the t- table of incense is. And the whole multitude were praying outside. So what is taking place is he goes into the temple. Now there's three things that, they, that happen in the temple, in this holy place. He probably has some helpers. Because the first thing is they have to collect the ashes off the altar of incense. So they collect all the ashes. And then they have to put new, fresh, hot coals. So apparently one comes in to collect the ashes, another comes in to uh, deposit the coals, but Zacharias has the most important job. His job is to put the incense on the live coals. And two things would happen when he put the incense on the live coals. Smoke would rise up, and there would be uh, the odor, the sweet-smelling odor of the incense. So the two helpers have backed their way out. Zacharias is standing now. Standing now before the altar of incense. On one side, on one side is the, uh, the candelabra. On the other side is the table of showbread. He looks toward heaven. He throws the incense on the hot coals. He observes. Now, the altar of incense is in front of him. Imagine this is the altar of incense. He's putting the coals on the altar. What is right there? Right there behind that altar of incense is the veil. And beyond the veil, God's presence, the Ark of the Covenant, the Shekinah glory. So what do you think he did? What did Isaiah do in the presence of God? He is now alone in the presence of God. He bows in prayer. And he puts the incense Upon the altar. Boom! An angel of God in the middle of the temple? It's amazing that he didn't fall out in a faint. He listens to the angel message. This is, this is Gabriel's third. The third message from Gabriel goes like this. Uh, verse 11, there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. 
Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. Fear fell upon him. The angel said, don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. What did the angel come to do? The angel came to say, you're, you're, you're going to have a baby. Your wife is going to get pregnant. Huh? Gabriel is called an angel of the Lord, and, and he declares the coming birth of John the Baptist. And, but he says more than that. There's something else he says. Why is the coming of John the Baptist so important? Because after John comes who? Let's try that again. After John comes Jesus. After John. So why John first? Well, he tells us. Verse 15, he'll be great before the Lord. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He'll go before him, before the Messiah, in the spirit and and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. You see, the time had come for the Messiah. But before the Messiah, God's people had to be prepared. And so John the Baptist was the one who would come to prepare. The angel had come to announce the coming birth of John the Baptist. God had heard the prayers of Zacharias and Elizabeth, and God had also heard the prayers of his people. The prayers for the coming of Messiah. I thought, what if an angel appeared today and said, God's heard your prayer for revival? What if an angel, like this angel, said, God's going to send his Messiah? God's going to send. You've been praying, you've been praying for a son and for the coming of the Messiah, and God's heard your prayer. What if God answered our prayer? God does answer prayer, doesn't he? And we, like Israel of old, wait for God to hear and answer our prayer. Gabriel announces John's birth. Just to pause a second, I I was trying to remember, and Trudy helped me remember, how our girls announced that they were going to have babies. Girls, how do you all do that? Scott and Betsy, I remember you all brought something to the house. Well, Julie had a baby before they did, and she brought a Prego spaghetti sauce. We're going to have spaghetti tonight, honey? No. Uh, Prego, Prego, Prego! A little hard for this old man to figure that out. But then, if I got it right, Betsy and Scott, I think, you came and we were in the kitchen, and you flopped a picture down. Is that right? Here's an ultrasound of our baby. And here's an ultrasound of the other one. That's you, Kate and Amelia. Uh, This was an announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, who would bring joy to his family, but also bring God's people back to the Lord their God to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Wouldn't it be great if you and I could be prepared for the coming of the Savior this year? For the celebration of his birth. Well, there's just one more. And it's the most familiar, so we'll cover it quickly. We'll have time to look at it some more as Christmas comes. 
But six months later, Gabriel had another trip. I don't know when he found out about it, but verse 26 says, In the sixth month, that's Elizabeth is six months pregnant, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. The angel said to her, verse 30, Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You'll call his name Jesus. He'll be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give unto him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever of his kingdom. There will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? The angel said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month with her who is called barren. Nothing will be impossible with God. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Wow. What an event that was. Mary, you're going to have a baby. Wait a minute. Hold on. I'm not married yet. And I haven't known a man. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The one to be born will be called holy. The Son of God. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. I'm the servant of the Lord. Let's go back. Let's summarize what we learned about angels from Gabriel. We've learned about angels, that angels have a special relationship with God. They stand in God's presence. Look at chapter 1 of Luke, verse 11. I'm sorry, let's see. Verse 19. Luke 1, verse 19. The angel answered and said, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and bring you good news. So while Zechariah is standing in the presence of God, Gabriel comes and says, oh yeah, I stand in the heavenly presence of God. He sent me with a message. Now, I want to hold on to these two things. I've added a third one. So we're at the close of the message this morning. And in our conclusion, I wrote down, and have you filled in the blanks? So... Put it back up there one more time. Let's get all those blanks. So Gabriel's two New Testament, two Old Testament and two New Testament. So the coming birth of John, the coming birth of Jesus, he was sent from God. He announced her part in the Messiah. Notice I'm using that word Messiah's birth, her part in the Messiah's birth. So now in the conclusion, go back to the conclusion now, ladies. Thank you. Um. Like Gabriel, I want to give one before these two. Like Gabriel, you and I have been created by God, right? You and I are created by God. We're created by God for a purpose. You got to say, oh, let me have a toy. Here. Does anybody remember what God created us for? What? To worship him, to honor and glorify him. Remember that? Someone asked Jesus on one occasion, what is the first and great commandment? And Jesus said, you shall, what is the first one? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and soul and mind. You, like Gabriel, were created. For what? Not so God can just watch out there and say, what is he doing today? No. 
you and I were created to worship God. Amen? To worship Him. We were made in His image so that we can give Him glory and praise. So, number two, like Gabriel, we stand in God's presence. So, you say, well, I don't see Him. If I stand in God's presence, where is He? It takes the eye of faith. Faith. To see God. Because He is what? Invisible. But He is where? So is He here? Is He in your home? Is He with you in the car? So you need to learn to see God. Because if you don't, then you don't understand that you stand in His presence. He is observing, and we are to observe Him, and we stand, as it were, at attention, waiting for His orders. You think the angels are just kind of, hey, uh, how you doing today? You know, what's happening down there? You know anything? No, no. They are attentive because of that third way in which we're like the angels. Number three, it's number two on the outline. Like Gabriel, we are sent. What is the message God has entrusted to us? What is that message? Now, you think Gabriel said, you know, I, I really like to do that today, God, but you know, I had other plans. God, you know, I, if I go, to, I'm going to scare people. Have you ever said to God, God, I can't deliver your message because I'm going to scare people. Gabriel could have said that. I'm scared, folks. You and I are entrusted with the greatest, most glorious message the world has ever known. Christ has come to save his people from their sins. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, here's my question. Gabriel did it all, right? How are we doing? How are we doing? Are we giving glory to God? Are we standing in His presence? Living our lives with an awareness of God? Are we taking that message faithfully to those to whom we've been sent? Regardless of their response. The angel Gabriel has a lot to teach us today. Amen? Let's pray. Oh God, we don't do as well. Gabriel did really well. He did everything you told him to. He delivered faithfully the message you gave him. Every time. Oh God, help us. We just don't do that well. Give us courage, Lord. Help us not to be afraid during this Christmas season to, yes, yes, shock, surprise some folks, but share the good news of Christ. Help us to be faithful messengers of God like Gabriel in Jesus' name. Amen. 133. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. You know that one? 133. It's in your hymnal if you don't know it. Let's sing. Hark the herald angels sing
angelic host proclaim. So we get in on it. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Let's sing that first verse again. It's a great one. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy So let's practice. I'm going to say it and then you repeat after me. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Say it. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Again, Christ is born. That's great news. The Messiah has come to save us from our sin. Take that message to folks today. I hereby commission you as servants of Almighty God. Take his glorious message message. God bless you.